What's up, my good people? Welcome to the CJ Moneyway Show. This is your boy, CJ Moneyway. Welcome to the show, entrepreneur, best-selling author, and best-selling and co-author of an Amazon bestseller. Welcome to the show, Debbie Wise. How you doing? I'm doing great. Thanks so much for having me, CJ. Uh, thank you for coming on today. Thank you for coming on today. So, Debbie, could you please tell us a little bit about yourself and about your background? Sure. So I became a family caregiver at the age of 17 when my father had a massive stroke and survived. And I was his caregiver for the next 30 years. And then when my oldest son was diagnosed on the autism spectrum at two, uh, I, I was always his caregiver, but that kicked it up quite a few notches. And then I later on became my husband's caregiver. So I have 40 years of caring for family members while still trying to have a career and, and all the things. Mm, mm, mm. That's, that's, I'm just saying 40 years, 40 years, over 40 years. Yep. Wow. So Debbie, uh, could you tell us about your book, uh, Heart Whisper, Whisperer? Sure. In that one, that's the one where I co-authored. I have a chapter. It's a collabor collaborative book of 20 different stories. And the story that I have in there is about facing my fear of public speaking. Mm -hmm. And when I turned 50, I had kind of an epiphany or an aha moment where I realized that I had lost myself. Mm -hmm. Not that I wouldn't care, you know, I would never not care for my family members, but I did that without simultaneously caring for myself. Mm -hmm. And I lost who I was as a person. And at that time, I thought to myself, you know, something about for me, the number 50 felt like, I probably don't have as many years in front of me <laughs> as I've already lived. And mm -hmm. I don't want to be that person who gets to the end of their life and who looks back with regret for things I didn't do. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have anything in particular that I was dying to do. I just felt like there had to be more. And since that time, I've kind of been on a journey discovering what is more. And I have found in the last decade or so that it's when I'm able to face my fear and do something anyway, mm -hmm. that the gift is on the other side. And I, I was never one to stand up to my fears. Mm. So until, until then. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, you, you said something that was very interesting that, that, that resonated with me when you said the age 50, it's like, you know, I got more years. I probably had had more years in front of me than I do ahead of me. And so, you know, I don't want to just be stagnant, you know, and there's some things that I could have did in life and, you know, look back and get up there. And he showed me all the opportunities that I missed out on just because I wouldn't move forward. And I, and it resonated with me because like I said, I actually started this podcast October 6, 2023, and I launched my first episode on my 50th birthday. I love that. You so know, when's your, wait, wait, I have to know, is your birthday in October? Yeah, October 6. Oh, it's October 73. I mean, 1973, yeah. So I'm October 9th, oh. except, except 1963. <laughs> Libra, Libra in the house. <laughs> no wonder we kicked it off so well. Exactly. The show. Except for the Mets thing. I'm not I'm not <laughs> here with that. I'm not here with that, Debbie. But um, but yeah, you know, as you say that, you know, you do get to a point where you you like, you know, hey, just let me just go for it. You know, if it work, it work. If it don't, then I can't say that I didn't give it a try, you know, instead of having regrets, like you said later on down the line. So yeah, I thank you for that. Uh, Debbie, could you tell us about your best-selling memoir, Second Thought? Maybe I can. I certainly can. So, you know, it the title really comes from 
that story in a way, because my whole life, I would say, I can't, I can't, I would always have a reason why any opportunity, small or, or big, I mean, I'm not talking about ma just major things, you know, why don't you learn to ski? No, I can't do that. You know, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And because I was afraid and I realized that if you take a minute after that knee jerk reaction of, I can't do that and think for a minute, well, wait a second on second thought, maybe I can, it changes everything. Mm. And so my book is my memoir. It's about 30 different stories chronicling parts of my life. And the first half is about my childhood and how I developed the limiting beliefs that I had about myself. And then, you know, the middle is about many, many different types of struggles that I've had in my life. Mm -hmm. And then the last part is about what's been happening the last 10 years since I've turned 50 and, and how I've started to change things. Mm, I like the dynamics. I like the I like the steps that you just presented. So um, before we go anywhere, uh, before I, before that, so where can we find this book at? Oh, you know, all the usual places online, Amazon and BarnesandNoble.com and all those places you can find it or on my website. Okay, okay. So Debbie, could you tell us about your podcast with the same title? Maybe I can. Yes. Maybe I can. So yeah, it's it's all the same theme on the podcast. I have solo episodes where I talk about, you know, different ideas or strategies or things that I've learned. And then I also have some interviews where I talk to people who have gone from a defeated I can't attitude to an empowered maybe I can or yes, I can attitude. Mm, so how long have your pod podcast been in uh, circulation? A little over a year. Okay. So uh, I, I've asked a few people this question. This was off the books. So what is the difference to you, or is it a difference, between being a podcast host and being a podcast guest? Oh, boy. I much prefer being a guest. <laughs> <laughs> I find it very, very challenging. And um, I give you a lot of credit for stepping up. And, and like you said, you went from every other week to twice a week. I mean, kudos to you because to do it right, it takes time and research and, you know, learning about your guests. And I, I find that <laughs> I might possibly be a little overcommitted and my podcast becomes, I don't want to say it's an afterthought, mm -hmm. but it's a little lower down my priority list. So I yeah. feel like, uh, you know, I don't do as good a job as I can, but I'm not beating myself up because it's an evolution. And, uh, you know, there are other uh, things right now that are taking priority. The yeah. podcast will move up the list. Yeah, I, I get it. I understand that, you know, because like with me, this is my pet project. You know, exactly. this, this is what I'm doing. Although I work a full time job and, you know, work doubles at that job and everything else. But this is what I'm doing. And so like 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 how you came on early today. I appreciate that, because as you said, and as you being a podcast host yourself, time is everything. You know, you got to research, like you say, you got to research people. I got to go through your profile and come up with questions, make the um you know, the, 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 the link, you know, so that you can come on and do the interview and yeah. promoting and things of that nature. So that's time. That's people's time. And, you know, it's frustrating when you waste, when you, you know, put time into something and either somebody don't show up or, you know, they cancel at the last minute, it becomes frustrating, but you know, you learn and you live and you deal with things because there's, you know, a brighter day because I meet somebody from New Jersey named Debbie Wise, who happens to be a Mets fan. You are. And <laughs> but so you're not, not holding against me. I'm not. I'm going to hold the Boston thing against you. Though. I'm not going to sit here. I'm not going to sit here and deny that with Debbie. My kids do in. too. They hold that against me too. Hey, hey kudos to your kids. I appreciate <laughs> them. And maybe I can. You said something earlier. 
And I'm going to move on that note. You said, you know, maybe I can't ski. Well, Debbie, I'm not going there. I can't, and maybe I can't. Me too. <laughs> maybe I ain't, you know what I'm saying? I'm but I can't, I can't <laughs> ski, but I did try. I'm not going to do that. Now I know for sure I can't. <laughs> Moving on to the next thing. Oh, man. So, uh, so Debbie. Could you tell us? Uh, uh, could you tell us about some of the challenges you have faced in your personal life? Oh, well, certainly, certainly, my caregiving has been a challenge, and it's been a challenge for a lot of different reasons. And for the longest time, it was because I was trying to do everything for everyone and not take care of myself, and I thought that it was selfish to prioritize my own self-care. And that was wrong because what wound up happening was I was, I became resentful of the people that I was caring for mm -hmm. and I was exhausted. I was overwhelmed. I also work full time and, um, you know, I wasn't showing up as the caring caregiver I wanted to be. Mm. So, uh, that is definitely a challenge. The other is that I, uh, almost a year and a half ago now became a widow mm. Sorry, hit that. and that has been, um, the journey leading up to that because my husband was diagnosed with terminal cancer six months before he died. Mm -hmm. But even a few years before that, he had other health problems that caused him to stop working. And he also suffered from depression and anxiety, which was exacerbated in the last six months of his life. So it was um, extremely, extremely stressful. So that period then leading into the period of, of grief and, and stepping into this, you know, solo life, we were together for 30 years. So mm -hmm. This is definitely a challenging time. Yeah, you know, um, and 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 I give you kudos for moving forward and having a the willpower to keep moving. You know, especially when you lose someone that you love. You know, that you've been with and invested all this time in. And I can speak from my mother's experience how hard it was for her. You know, as far as losing. You know, as we talked before, I lost my father. That was like. Uh, almost nine years ago this november yeah. and the thing is you know a kid a, a children we lose a father but a mother but a, a wife loses a husband and that's you know the the, the dynamics are different you know absolutely they bonded with each other like that and everything and so um you know i just i just pray that god will give you the strength to continue moving forward although we don't we don't forget you know what i'm saying things or whatever yeah. But uh, as the saying go, life goes on, you know. And exactly. And, and, you know, I've got to be there for my kids. And and like you said, they lost their dad. It is different. But um, I had my children later in life. So they're still young mm -hmm. adults. They're in uh, 21 and 23, two mm -hmm. boys I have. And, uh, yeah, it's it's young to lose your dad, you know, so yeah. it's difficult for them too. So I have to be here for all of us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I pray that God will continue giving you the strength and, and continue blessing your family because that, cause if you haven't been through it, you don't understand it. Right. Exactly. And, so, and you know, when, when that time comes, everybody is there and you know the support system is there and everybody is you know uh uh c consoling you and this and that but then when it's over with that's when the real you know what i'm saying grief exactly and comes in. All, it, all those it, people they're not that there. that's right they go back to their regular lives mm -hmm. right and you're looking around saying nothing will ever feel regular again yeah it'll it'll never feel the same um, I actually wrote my memoir while my husband was dying mm. and I had been contemplating signing up for this 12 week course to help first time authors, since I had no idea what I was doing, mm -hmm. write 
write their book. And I was thinking about it and almost had said yes. And then my husband was diagnosed. And so of course I said, how am I doing this now? You know, I was going to say no. And at the time I was seeing a therapist and I told her and she said, you know, I disagree with you. I actually think this is the perfect time because you're going to need something separate from what's going on in, you know, your world right now, that's just for you. And she was right because it, it almost turned into my own form of self care. And I made it a priority every day, you know, I would get up and I'd write at six o'clock in the morning when my husband was still sleeping, or if he, um, you know, didn't need me for an hour in the afternoon, I'd say, I'm going upstairs. And unless it's an emergency, don't bother me. And when he was in the hospital, I would bring my computer and my snacks and my drinks. It looked like I was moving in, at, you know, and I'd go there every day. And when he was napping, you know, in the hospital, I'd open my computer and I'd write. And when he died, I was three chapters shy of finishing. Mm. And the first draft was due to the editor two weeks later. And of course she said, don't be ridiculous. You know, we'll extend the timeline under the circumstances. And just like you said, after everyone left, I said, you know what? No, I'm going to make that deadline because it helped me while he was dying. Mm -hmm. And now it's going to help me because it's going to give me something else to focus on, you know, when kind of my world is falling apart. And, and that's what I did. And uh -huh. it was, it it was hard, but it was it was helpful. Yeah, I'm just, I'm I'm just listening to you. And I'm listening to your story, and I'm just sitting here thinking how how amazing is he to be preparing us for our next level when we're going through a tragic situation. But he's building us in other areas of our lives so that when this comes, cause this shall pass too. Yep. And so when this pass is over, he has already given us comfort in something else you know although like we say you will never forget about this but i'm not going to dwell on that for the rest of my life the memories you know that we shared would always be there but he has he has given me another stepping stone to move forward so uh i commend you on that debbie i really do for Thank you know you. just continue doing the things that you're doing so um debbie when you speak about uh a victim's mentality mm -hmm. What do you actually mean by that? Oh boy. I'll never forget when I realized, oh, oh crap. I think that's me. <laughs> 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 so for the majority of my life, I blamed everything and everyone else for my life circumstances, except for myself. You know, all of the things had happened to me, you know, my father having the stroke, my son, my, I had infertility struggles. I have had a lifelong weight issue. I've, you know, so many different things. Right. Mm -hmm. And I would look at my friends and I'd say, you know, yeah, they have problems, but they're nothing like mine. And even they would feed into that and say, oh my goodness, I never knew anyone who just keeps having one thing after another. And I said, oh yeah, poor, oh, poor me. You know, uh, why me? Why did this have to happen to me? Mm -hmm. And that was living like a victim. And I was not taking responsibility. Everybody has stuff and some of us have more stuff than others at different times in our lives, right? But it's how we respond to these things that makes us who we are. Mm -hmm. And instead of pointing fingers at everyone or everything else, it was time to turn the finger and look in the mirror. Yeah. You know? Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I agree with you. I think Michael Jackson had one of the best songs ever that people really didn't pay attention to when he say, the man in the mirror. Man in the mirror. Yep. Yeah. The man in the mirror. You know, you have to take accountability 
for your actions and your thoughts and the things that you know you're done you have done in life you know so yeah so sometimes and that's the hard reality right there that, that, it that, is that's one of the hardest things to do is to sit there and hold yourself accountable for what you feel you know saying has been done to you i was listening to you as you said i don't know how much you know uh a Bible person you are, or, you know, your, your religion or anything, but it made me think of the story of Job when you said that, like, your friend said, well, everything's just happening, you know, back to back to back to back, and so how do you sustain that, you know, sometimes it's a, it's a test to us on how we endure trials and tribulations, you know, as he said, are, are we going to curse them, or are we still going to give them, you know, the glory and the honor in spite of what we're going through because he know better than we do. <laughs> you know? Well, so. and right. And honestly, let's I, I, looking back now, right. That's what's made me the person I am today mm -hmm. going through those things and finding out things about myself and, and never realizing just how much strength I actually do have. You mm -hmm. know, I, I think so many times people would look at different things that I was going through and they're like, oh, I don't know how you do that. I could never do that. And I couldn't stand when people said that to me because mm -hmm. you know what? If you were faced with this situation, you would do it. Yeah. You, you don't do know it. what your strength is. Your strength, you know what I'm saying? You, you just some some people can make it, some people can't. You know, I, yeah. I don't want to get into that, but some right. people just have that, you know, if I got to go through it, I'm going to go through it. I'm not going to quit and give up because, as you said earlier, because I have more things to live for. I got two two, two uh, young young boys that I still yep. have to be a mother to, you know, things of that nature. I still have things in life that still has to be accomplished, you know, through me or change, like things that you're doing in the world right now, like writing these books. It's going to change somebody else's life. It's going to inspire somebody else. So there's still things that I have to do, you know, moving forward. So, hey, keep doing it, Debbie. Just keep doing what you're doing, baby. I'm sorry. Oh. Just keep doing what you're doing, sweetie. Thank you. Uh, I will. So, Debbie, how did you begin to change once you realized that you were in control of your life? So the very first thing I actually, I didn't even, <laughs> what I did was I decided that the first thing I had to tackle was my weight. I have, from the minute I was born, I always had a weight issue. And for those of us who have had this happen. You know, it's just your whole life is dieting and feeling good about yourself and then gaining back the weight and feeling crappy about yourself. And you mm -hmm. go back and forth and back and forth and you're always looking for the magic answer and there is none. And, and here's another example where I would always look at the skinny person who happened to be eating, you know, tons of junk on Saturday night. And I'd be like, look at her. She can eat whatever she wants and she has this <laughs> knockout body and there's me and I look at it and I gain 10 pounds. And <laughs> even though there might've been, you know, there is some genetic component. I'm not like, mm. there's no reason to go into that, but, but what I wasn't really thinking is maybe she doesn't eat like that every meal. Mm. Right. You know? Mm. And so I decided that that was the first thing that I needed to tackle. And I approached it differently for the first time in my life. Instead of having a perfectionist kind of mindset, like I'm either on and I'm perfect or the minute, you know, I eat a cookie, I'm a failure. Mm. And I just decided that I was going to, I was going to Weight Watchers. That was the one diet that, you know, was had I have had success on in the past. And I said, I'm, I'm not going to worry about how much I lose, uh, what I'm eating. The only thing I'm going to do is I am going to go and I'm going to attend a meeting every week. That's mm. it. I'm not doing anything else. And I did that for about three months until I was like solid in that. And I didn't lose any weight. But once I had that down, I took another small step. You know, I was going to pay attention to what I ate 50% of the time or something like that. Mm -hmm. And I just kept building 
And it was really a mindset shift. You know, I realized there is no deadline. The deadline is when I stop breathing. Like mm. this is going to be a, a lifestyle change. My kids used to make fun of me because they would see me eating something and they're like, is that in your diet? And I'd say, mm. it's not a diet, it's a lifestyle. And everyone calls it that now, but 10 years ago, everybody wasn't calling it that. And they're like, mm. is that in your lifestyle, mom? You know, <laughs> making fun of me. But I realized, so it was all a mindset shift and uh -huh. I'm not, you know, at the goal weight and that's cool because yeah. I, it is what it is. And when I saw how just changing my mindset changed everything, I realized that was like, oh, well, maybe I can apply this to other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. And so that's where. kind of all started so yeah i mean <laughs> like you say it, it, it's a lifestyle change and it, the, the main thing i guess it is is just being committed to what you're doing you know as far as um uh, you know you set a goal and a lot of times we set a lot of goals and sometimes you get to them sometimes you don't uh, it, it, it's just like saying okay you know like like i work doubles a lot at work right and so but if I don't have the mindset to say, you know what, I'm gonna work three doubles this week. And if I get to that day and I'll be like, you know what, I don't feel like working today. You know what I'm saying? And I go home, yeah. you, it's, it's all in the mind. You have to build yourself up to what yep. you want to do, you know, because if you don't, then you can change your mind at any time because you haven't, as, as we say, prep talk yourself, you know what I'm saying? Into oh, yeah. doing that. Oh, yeah. That, you can talk yourself doing. either any way you want, in, yeah. in or yeah. out. Yeah, in or out, in or out. So, Debbie, how has your daily life changed since you realized <laughs> that you're in control? Um, well, it's changed tremendously because I'm very, very lucky that I, so I'm an insurance agent mm. and I've had my own agency for 29 years and I have an incredible group of women who work for me. Uh, mm. One for 20, has worked for me for 27 years. And when my husband um, was sick, I wasn't able to go to the office. I had to be home with him all the time. And I was the kind of person who was, you know, just because I was the so-called boss, that didn't make a difference. You know, I was there every day and every at the right, you know, nine to five or earlier or whatever later. And it was killing me. Like I just felt so guilty. And after my husband passed away and I spoke to uh, my one team member who's been with me so long and she, you know, ran the show. And I said, you know, how did you find it? And she said, <laughs> she said something I shocked me. Mm -hmm. Her answer was one word and it was empowering. Mm. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, this whole time I've basically been a micromanager. Mm-hmm. And by me stepping away, it allowed her to step into her power. Mm. And that changed everything for me because that gave me permission to be able to get in a 10, work from home on Tuesdays so I could record a podcast mm -hmm. or work on my, you know, I'm writing another book. So work on my other book. And it's kind of taken, it was a self-imposed pressure that I was putting on myself. Mm. And so I find now that I have such a, a different attitude towards my day that even though I'm working and it might not be in my insurance job all the time, mm -hmm. it's, it's then working like you are on something that you love and feel passionate about. And just doesn't that change everything? Yeah, yeah, it, it does. It does. You know, just to, you know, you don't know who you're making a difference for, you know, or where this person might come from. As we 
look at life sometimes we look at people who are closest to us where we feel as though that that would be our closest allies but you know in reality a lot of times it's not you know things that debbie may be doing she's reaching people in you know th uh, thailand or you yeah. know in, in different countries and people that we don't even know and so i think you know moving forward and things like that uh, that's what a lot of people don't understand like how far when you begin to do something like your podcast when you begin to write books uh like you're doing and you know still maintaining the business and you know having trusted people <laughs> trusted people that you can uh you know confide in and believe in that the reach the other things that you're doing the reach and the people that you're touching in so many different places is like the lady said, empowering. Yeah. Empowering. <laughs> you know, so so yeah, kudos to all the things that you're doing, Deb. Um one other thing that I like to ask before we before we wrap up. Sure. What advice would you give to any inspiring authors out there right now? No. <laughs> Um, I think you have to hold yourself accountable because it's so easy to find an excuse not to write. Um, writing my second book, interestingly enough, was more difficult because when my husband was dying, it was, it sounds ridiculous. Mm -hmm. It was easier or more important to find the time to write. And then when I had more of the freedom and all the other things like back in my life, there was always a reason not to write because it, look, I'm not a writer by trade. And I know that, you know, every, even people who are everyone is works differently. Mm -hmm. Um, I find it a chore. I mean, sometimes it's a chore and, and then there are other days where it just kind of flows freely. You just mm -hmm. don't know, but in order to make it happen, I do feel like you need to be, uh, get into a consistent, consistent habit. And the minute that you get away from that, it all falls apart. Yeah, I mean, I, I I totally agree with you. I've, I've I've interviewed some book writers, some authors, and just my own experience myself, I understand exactly what you mean as far as not being a writer. I am not a story writer at all. That's why I get it. Somebody else re-edit it and do whatever. It's but it's still your throat, your thoughts. Yeah. You, you know, yeah. you know what I'm saying? And yes. it's your thoughts and the things that you're doing. And I can understand, you know, as you said, um, that you know situation with your husband and how you know you had the time or you made the time to do what you was doing and how more difficult it is doing now than it was then you know a, a lot of times you know too that still i i mind you know you still fresh on on on, on what happened and sometimes you just don't feel like doing things you know i i can get it that some days are better than others. And then when you do pick up the 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 gifts to do something, you know, you can get turned away and you got other things to focus on and you know prioritize this and that. But I tell you what, Debbie, I I I I'm looking forward to your second book. I'm Thank gonna you. grab this, I'm gonna grab the first one. Um what can we find you at on your social handles, on your social media and, and things of that nature? So my website is Debbie R. Weiss. The R is important. Otherwise, you find a realtor in California. Oh, and God. so that's pretty much everything on social on Instagram. It's Debbie.r.weiss. And everywhere else, pretty much it's it's the same with the Debbie R. Weiss. Okay. So are there any other thing, any other projects, anything that you're working on that we can look forward to in the near future besides yeah, the second well, book? Yeah, so, so like I said, my next book is called The Sprinkle Effect. And um, it is essential steps to begin transforming your life. My first book is, you know, like I said earlier, stories and my memoir and inspirational. And this second book is a little bit more of the how-to 
how did I start to change my life and what were the steps that I took? with stories sprinkled in there as well. And so right now, as a matter of fact, right before this call, I just kind of finalized my publishing date of November 11th mm. of this year. So- Okay, congrats. Thank you. So it's very, very exciting. Yeah, the sprinkler effect. Hey, so today, my Money Way listeners, you have been listening to Debbie Wise. Go and get the sprinkler effect coming out November 11th. She has a book out right now. Maybe I can check out our podcast. Same title. Maybe I can. This is your boy CJ Moneyway. We out of here. Peace.